welcome back everybody to this video uh, lecture series for Introduction to Philosophy. In this video we continue our discussion of Plato's Apology and we do so picking up where we left off last time. You'll recall in our previous video we looked at the way in which Socrates rejected the accusations made by Miletus. Now we won't go in detail again about how he, does, how he rejects those claims but essentially Socrates thinks he shows that Miletus is not taking the accusation seriously he really doesn't care about the corruption of the youth and hasn't put the proper sort of philosophical reflection in place to even know what is truly the good of a human life. And because he, he hasn't done that, he really is in no position to bring Socrates to court on the accusation that he is making the, the youth worse off. Okay. Now, what's interesting is you might say, well, okay, if Socrates has in fact shown that these charges are unfounded, and maybe you disagree with his arguments, but let's say for the sake of argument that he's shown that Miletus' Miletus's charges simply have no basis. Then you might say, well, what else does he have to say? Right? What is there to keep going on about? Isn't that the whole point of his defense? What's interesting is that if you think about the apology in its totality, very little of it is actually spent responding to the official charges made against him. And I would suggest to you that this is because Socrates has a larger agenda or a larger purpose in mind. And we start to see that right after his cross-examination of Miletus. So let's see what he says, right? So he, Socrates certainly thinks he has shown Miletus' charges to be baseless, but he also says, I very much um, do not think that this is going to get me off, all right? I don't think that um, I'm going to be acquitted. In fact, he says, I'm sure the jury is going to convict me. Right, and if I am convicted, he said, it's not Miletus or Anitus who's really responsible, but the slander or malice of many people. It has certainly convicted many other good men as well, and I imagine it will do so again. There's no danger it will stop with me. So even though Socrates thinks that he has shown the charges to have no real foundation, he also says this bad reputation, the slanders that have been built up against me over many years are ultimately going to lead to my conviction and lead to my death. Now, this brings up an interesting question because we might say, well, wait a minute. Yes, perhaps some of your reputation is unfounded, but didn't you in some way contribute to the situation? Aren't the activities that you were undertaking in Athens, aren't they at least in part responsible for the way people um, see you, for the reputation you have, and for the fact that now many people are going to vote to put you to death? In fact, we might legitimately ask, has Socrates acted rather recklessly with his own life? And Socrates himself poses this very question. He asks someone, he imagines someone asking him, aren't you ashamed, Socrates, to have engaged in the sort of occupation that has now put you at risk of death? And this is a question that seems legitimate in general, right? There are many situations where we say, you know, you're engaging in extremely risky behavior, you're texting and driving, you're not wearing a seatbelt, um, you're not taking proper care of your health, right? We say there's all sorts of ways in which you can act in ways that are shameful that unnecessarily put your life at risk. Now, this doesn't mean it's always wrong to put your life at risk. Of course not. We actually put our life at risk all the time. But there are some ways in which we would say someone is shamefully doing or recklessly doing it. And it's natural to ask at this point whether Socrates has in fact done this. Has his activity of philosophical questioning, where he went into the marketplace among the people, forced them to examine their own beliefs, annoyed many people, questioned the basis of the Athenian democracy, have all these activities brought upon himself a situation in which his life is now at risk unnecessarily? Now, there are a couple points here. First, again, you might say, why are we even asking this question? What does this have to do with the charges? And I think the reason gets back to what I was saying previously about this larger agenda in view. What Socrates ultimately wants to do is not just show why the charges are baseless. I think that's actually a secondary thing for him. What he wants to do with the jury is the same thing he's been doing in Athens his entire life. Force people to engage in philosophical, philosophical examination of their own lives, think about what's really important in a human life, and how an excellent human life should be lived. And part of that for Socrates is to think about 
what is bad about death or what is the value of death? How bad a thing is death? To what extent should we avoid death, right? How valuable is our continued life? At what cost? The way Socrates is going to answer this question is, no, I haven't engaged in shameless activity. It's true I put my life at risk of being ended. I put myself at risk of death. But I've done so for a higher purpose. And this higher purpose not only justifies the fact that I will now be put to death, but would not be worth sacrificing just for the sake of remaining alive. This is at least the claim Socrates wants to make. Now, how is he going to do this? Um, well, we're going to see the argument he makes, but before we get there, we should first actually look a little bit more closely, just to put a fine point on it, at all the ways in which Socrates really has seemed to put his life at risk. So these come from various points in the speech, but at one point in the speech, he, he imagines well, s someone telling him, okay, Socrates, what if we said we would let you go, um, you know, we wouldn't put you to death, but you have to agree from this point on to stop practicing philosophy. And here's how Socrates says he would reply. If you made that offer, I'd say, I have the utmost respect and affection for you, men of Athens, but I'll obey the God rather than you. As long as I draw breath and am able, I won't give up practicing philosophy. Now, this, this passage right here encapsulates why I titled this lesson, in part, the idea that Socrates is a philosophical martyr. So a martyr is someone who's willing to die for a cause. The term is usually used in a religious context. So someone is willing to, you know, for instance, die instead of converting away from their religion or, um, or die for their religious beliefs in some other manner. And here what we see is Socrates as a sort of philosophical martyr. Even up upon pain of death, he would not stop practicing philosophy. He would not stop questioning other people and forcing them to examine what the truth is and whether their beliefs are actually true. So this is certainly one way in which he has put his life in risk um, of being ended, put himself in, in a certain amount of danger. In another part of the speech, Socrates says, I will... You know, what people would usually do at this point is, um, you know, they would bring their family and friends up in front of the jury, and they would ask them to make a case for them uh, that they ought to be allowed to live. You know, you would use an emotional appeal. Here are my, ch here's my children, here's my wife, here are my friends. Please spare my life. Think about how sad it will make them. And Socrates says, I do have relatives, sons too, men of Athens, three of them. So he has three sons, one already a young men, while two are still children. Nonetheless, I won't bring any of them forward here and then entreat you to vote for my acquittal. So he won't engage in any use of emotional appeal. Right? He would rather die than do that. And finally, one of the more <laughs> sort of humorous parts of the apology is, so after Socrates is eventually convicted, um, then it comes time for sentencing. And the proposed penalty is death. But usually what happens is the defendant is allowed to, pro allowed to propose a counter penalty. And if, you know it's one that the jury would agree to, they might um, accept that instead of death. So really what the jury wanted him to do was just say, uh, would just propose exile. They didn't necessarily want to kill Socrates, they just didn't want him in Athens anymore. So if he would have proposed the penalty of exile, he would have been forced to live elsewhere, but they would have let him live, let him live just fine, and they would have moved on with their lives. But he refuses to do this. And in fact, as we're going to see, Socrates sees himself as a gift to the city of Athens. And because he sees himself as a gift or benefit to the city of Athens, he says, well, here's the punishment I should be given. I should la be allowed to have free meals for a lifetime in the Prytaneum. And what's the Prytaneum? It was simply the place where heroes of war and, um, and athletes who, who had won medals and who were victorious, it's where they went to have great meals and, and essentially be celebrated. So he says, what should my punishment be for what I've done? Free meals for life, of course. Now this is obviously going to be very annoying to the jury, and as a result, they give him the death penalty. But he's, again, he refuses to propose the counter penalty they want. He refused to take exile. He, and, and part of this is because he didn't see himself as being guilty. He didn't see himself as being worthy of punishment. So he's not going to suggest a punishment. He sees himself as worthy of reward, so he's going to suggest a reward. So there were so many points along the way 
where Socrates could have avoided his own death, and yet he didn't. So the question is, why? Why did he have this absolute commitment to philosophy, even in the face of death? Now, let me return to our original question. Aren't you ashamed, Socrates, to have engaged uh, in the sort of occupation that's put you in risk of death? There's two reasons one might give for why Socrates should be ashamed. Right? Um, the first reason one might give is that, you know, what Socrates has done is shameful because it's shameful to suffer evil at the hands of an enemy. So who would his enemy be in this case? His accusers, Miletus, Anetus, and Lycon. And, you know, if he ultimately is put to death, then in a sense he loses to them and they come out victorious. We might say, well, it's shameful to lose to an enemy. The second reason one might say that he should be ashamed is because, well, death itself is a bad thing. There are many bad things that can happen to someone, but maybe you might even say death is the worst thing. Because while many bad things that happen, right, we, someone steals from you or you lose a loved one, right, they cause you to lose something in your life. Death causes you to lose all of your life, causes you to lose everything. So death might be the worst thing. Now, what we're going to see is that, in fact, Socrates rejects both of these claims. First, he doesn't think there's anything shameful about, quote-unquote, losing to Miletus and Nidus and Lycon. In fact, he doesn't think it's losing at all. And we're going to look at this first reason in this video. And secondly, he doesn't really think death is a bad thing. In fact, one of the main themes of the end of the Apology, and especially in the Phaedo, which we'll be covering in a few weeks, he sees death as potentially a good thing, a blessing, or at least, at worst, a neutral sort of state that's not bad at all. It's certainly not worth um, going against or undermining his own principle. Okay, so we'll leave the badness of death discussion for the next video, but let's look at this question further. Why doesn't he think it's shameful for him, for him to lose to Miletus, Anetus, and Lycon, for them to successfully take his life? So here's the argument he gives. I'm going to call this the argument from justice and shame. So the first premise says one should never do what is shameful. Pretty straightforward. Uh, you know, a shameful act seems to imply that it's one sh someone shouldn't do. But let's look at P2. It is shameful to avoid a personal evil, like loss of wealth, power, reputation, being exiled, or even dying, by doing something that is unjust. Okay, now this is a fundamental principle of Socrates, which we'll also see in the next uh, dialogue we cover, the Credo. It's this idea that anything bad that, you can, that can happen to you personally is not worth avoiding at the cost of injustice. And so we can think of simple examples like this. You might say, yeah, okay, well, take wealth. Yeah, I mean, it's good to, to gain money, but not if you have to cheat or defraud people. It's good to have power and a good reputation, but again, if you have to do it in nefarious ways that harm other people and doing something unjust or unfair, then yeah, that doesn't seem like something you should do. It seems shameful to do that, to sacrifice your moral character for the sake of wealth, power, or reputation. But notice he says here, even dying. And this should bring up the following question. Are there any shameful ways of extending a person's life? If there can be shameful ways of extending one's bank account, of, of, of gaining more money, then you might say, well, there should be also shameful ways of continuing to live. And we can think of a couple of examples of this. One, you might imagine a soldier in a military context who has a duty to remain in a certain post, and when the enemy is coming, this person um, has a bout of cowardice, runs away, and in order to preserve their life possibly putting their comrades in, in harm's way because they were relying on this person. You might say this is an example of a way in which one has extended one's life but done so shamefully. Perhaps more controversially, I'm reminded here, there's a famous philosophical article published in 1997. Um, it's called, Is There a Duty to Die? by John Hardwig. And he considers the idea, at a certain point in our lives, is there a duty to actually bring an end to our life? And he gives various arguments for why, and one of the reasons is that as we become older, it's quite possible that our very existence be could become a burden unto others. We don't often think of it in this way, but the very fact that you exist, 
puts you in a position of dependence on other people. There has to be a social and political structure where food and shelter are available, and if that doesn't work, right, your existence relies upon that. And in more mundane ways, as we age, as we become older, it's entirely common for family members to need to be there to give us greater care. And of course, that's perfectly natural and fine, but the point that Hardwick makes is that there may be a point at which the value that your life gives to you is much smaller in comparison to the burden that you become upon others. And his argument is that essentially in such a case, it would be shameful to demand that you continue to exist. So this is the idea behind P2. It's just that there are some shameful ways of avoiding one's death. Now, the way Socrates explains this, he says, well, of course this must be the case, right? He says, you're not thinking straight, sir, if you think a man who's any use at all should give any opposing weight to the risk of living and dying instead of looking to this alone whenever he does anything, whether his actions are just or unjust. So all that matters is, is your action just or unjust? And you should always act justly, should always act correctly, even it means, if it means you're going to die. What is that cause? Okay, so let's look at the third premise. Socrates says if he stops practicing philosophy to please the jury and save his life, then he will be avoiding a personal evil, namely death, by doing something that's unjust. Just like the soldier who abandons his post and leaves his comrades uh, vulnerable has done something unjust to avoid death, Socrates says if I stop practicing philosophy, I'm abandoning my post, or as he puts it, I'm abandoning, abandoning my station. He said, but if when the god stationed me here, remember he thinks he's on a mission from the god Apollo to um, continue going about um, Athens and questioning his fellow citizens, as I became thoroughly convinced he did, to live practicing philosophy, examining myself and others, I had for fear of death or anything else abandoned my station. So Socrates says, were I to stop practicing philosophy just to continue to live, I would have abandoned my station, I would have done something that is unjust. And this is fundamentally the reason why Socrates would not stop practicing philosophy to please the jury and save his life. Now, in the next video, we're really going to get more into why he has this deep fundamental commitment to philosophy. But for the moment, we can see why he thinks he would be doing something unjust were he to stop philosophy. And I've suggested to you that his philosophical mission he thinks he must fulfill involves going around and questioning his fellow citizens, but you might ask, to what end? What is the purpose? What does he hope they will get out of this questioning? And ultimately, in his view, he says, well, what I'm trying to get them to do is to care about what's most important in life, in life truth, justice, and care for the soul. He says, my excellent man, you're an Athenian. You belong to the greatest city, renowned for its wisdom and strength. Are you not ashamed that you take care to acquire as much wealth as possible and reputation and honor, but that about wisdom and truth, about how your soul may be in the best possible condition, you take neither care nor thought? So he's struck by the fact that in such an excellent city, so many people are so caught up in gaining wealth and power and influence and, and having a good reputation in the eyes of their peers, but not truly thinking about how to gain wisdom, truth, and justice, and make sure their soul is in the best possible condition. And of course, how have, as we've seen, how does Socrates think your soul becomes in the best possible condition? Through pursuing the truth. How do you pursue the truth? Through philosophy. So his activity of engaging in philosophical questioning of his fellow Athenians is a way of forcing them to engage in philosophy. It's a way of helping them improve the condition of their soul, to care for their soul, to care about truth. And likewise, to care much less about money and power and influence. Right? And because, and this has another important implication as well, because in Socrates' view, what truly matters is truth, justice, and care for the soul, he says that even though his accusers can put him to death, there's nothing they can actually do to harm him. And this is actually one of my favorite passages from the Apology. So Socrates says, he's talking directly to his accusers now, You may be sure that if you put me to death, a man of the sort I said it was just now, 
you won't harm me any more than you harm yourselves. Certainly Miletus or Anetus couldn't harm me in any way. That's not possible. For I don't think it's lawful for a better man to be harmed by a worse. He may of course kill me, or perhaps banish or disenfranchise me, and these he believes to be very bad things, and, other, and no doubt others agree. But I don't believe this. Rather, I believe that doing what he's doing now, attempting to kill a man unjustly, is far worse. So think about this exchange. Miletus and Nenus and Lycon will have successfully put Socrates to death, and Socrates, as a result, dies. And we ask, who came out on the better end of this? Well, the first thing Socrates says is, nothing they have done can possibly harm me, even though they've put me to death. And why is that? Because remember, for Socrates, what truly matters is the goodness of our soul. And there's nothing you can take away from someone in a physical sense, a merely physical sense, that can make his soul in a worse condition. So you can take all Socrates' money, you can exile him to another city, you can take away all his power and influence, you can even kill him. None of that is going to touch his character, none of that is going to touch who, what truly makes him who he is. None of that is going to hinder him from pursuing the truth, from engaging in his philosophical mission. And on the other hand, he says, well, going back to the claim that he's lost to Miletus and Nidus and Lycon, he says, no, they've lost. They've done something horribly unjust. And so there's nothing they can do to harm me. In fact, all they've done is harm themselves. They've taken away things like power, wealth, and influence in my life that they think are important. But those things don't really matter. What does matter is doing what's right. And on that score, they've failed. So they're far worse off than I am. Which is exactly why he says, nothing, there's nothing they can do to harm me. And there's a further point he says on this score to the jury as well. You notice in the title, I also characterize Socrates as a gadfly. This is in fact the term he himself uses. And I told you that he saw himself as being a benefit to Athens. And what is that benefit? Well, he describes it here. So men of Athens, I'm far from pleading in my own defense now. Remember, he's not concerned about his life. Instead, I'm pleading in yours so that you don't commit a great wrong against the God's gift to you by condemning me. If you put me to death, you won't easily find another like me. Okay, well, why does that matter? Why is Socrates' presence in Athens so important? For even if it seems ridiculous to say so, I've literally been attached to the city, as if to a large thoroughbred horse that was somewhat sluggish because of its size and needed to be awakened by some sort of a gadfly. So the image he gives here, we have a large sluggish horse that's kind of ponderously moving around and we have this little annoying fly that sort of maybe goes up and pricks it or annoys it kind of wakes it up socrates is that gadfly and he says in the city of athens in this analogy is like the big sluggish horse and what does socrates do it's as just such a gadfly it seems to me that the god has attached me to the city one that awakens conjoles and reproaches each and every one of you and never stops alighting everywhere on you the whole day. So the reason the city of Athens is like this big sluggish horse is because he thinks that these citizens are complacent in their beliefs. They believe to be true what is the common sense thing to, to believe is true. They believe what a good life is is what the common sense belief is. Going after wealth and money and power and influence. And clinging desperately to extend their life and fearing death. These sorts of common sense beliefs that you can see in all human societies. But of course, Socrates thinks this is exactly wrong. They're not focusing on the right things. But as long as there's no one around to question the orthodox common sense, to question the status quo, people will continue to believe that this is what a human life is really all about. So Socrates sees himself as a gift to the city because he's the one that forces the citizens of Athens to question what they're doing. He forces them to think critically about what really is good in human life and whether they really have wisdom or knowledge about how to live well. So he says, look, um, you can put me to death. That's fine. But it's really a greater harm to you. Because you'll miss out on the influence of this gadfly that doesn't allow you just to be complacent in the beliefs that feel comfortable to you. 
And he expands a little more on this role as a gadfly. He says, well, it's had a number of consequences. It's, it's prevented him from taking place in public affairs, he says. And in part, you know, so he says he's never really participated in politics. And you can see why this might be the case, right? To participate in politics, you have to, in a certain extent, be willing to compromise with others. And Socrates is not at all willing to compromise his principles. He will always question in pursuit of the truth. Um, and so there's a sense in which he couldn't fulfill his philosophical mission if he was forced to compromise with other, others. In addition, because of the sort of because he was unable to participate in public affairs in order to do his mission, it resulted in his complete poverty. And again, he thinks this is an e a piece of evidence that, in fact, he cannot be a sophist. And a final claim he makes on the score that's rather interesting is he says, Through all this philosophical questioning I've engaged in, at no point have I actually become anyone's teacher. And this is important because what Miletus is essentially saying is that Socrates is a teacher of the youth of Athens and his teachings corrupt them. But he says here, in fact, I've never been anyone's teacher at any time. If anyone, whether young or old, wanted to listen to me while I was talking and performing my own task, I never begrudged that to him. Neither do I engage in conversation only when I receive a fee and not when I don't. Rather, I offer myself to questioning for rich and poor alike, or if someone prefers, he may listen to me and answer my questions. And if any of those turned out well or did not do so, I cannot justly be held responsible. So what Socrates says is, look, I'm not a teacher. I go around questioning people and people like to listen to me. And so if some of the youth turned out well or they turned out poorly as a result of listening to me, I can't be responsible for that because I was never there to teach them any doctrines. Now we might question to what extent that's true, but let's take this idea seriously for a moment that Socrates does not see himself as a teacher. This connects to some rather deep themes in Socrates' thought we've already seen, namely the theme of Socratic wisdom and the theme of having intellectual humility. Remember Socrates' wisdom, he says, is that he knows he doesn't know anything great or excellent. And while he has the ability to question other people, and to force them to examine their own beliefs, he doesn't claim to know exactly what it means to be virtuous, what it means to live an excellent human life. And so he says, so for him, to, if he was a teacher, that would seem to imply that he had that sort of knowledge to impart, that he knew what it means to live a virtuous human life, and that could list off and tell someone how to do that. But instead, he simply denies that, and he has to, because he has to own up to the fact that he doesn't have that sort of knowledge. So for him, it's very important that he's not a teacher. He's simply someone who poses questions and forces us to confront our own beliefs. And of course, in his view, if he isn't a teacher, then likewise he can't really be responsible for corrupting the youth. All he is doing is encouraging people to think critically. Now, should we buy that? I'll leave you just with this final question. Is it possible to corrupt someone, not necessarily by teaching them a certain doctrine to believe, but is it possible to corrupt someone by encouraging them to use their critical thinking faculties? And it seems weird, especially in a philosophy class, where literally the point is to encourage you to be a critical thinker, to use your reason to evaluate whether beliefs are true. And I, for one, think that this is an, a skill everybody should try to develop. I have this hope that a society of people who are better at engaging in critical thinking would be a better, more just, more humane, more hopeful society. But I can see someone arguing, or at least pushing back somewhat. I can see someone saying, well, look, that depends. Is this person ready? Is this person ready to exercise their crit critical thinking faculties? Or are they still too immature? Because the ability to use reason and argument can be a powerful tool. And if put in the hands of the wrong people, you might say, well, that could lead to dis disastrous effects. Socrates has already told us that many of the young people who followed around him around imitate him. And we might wonder, should Socrates have taken better care to consider 
are these young people going to use uh, imitate me well? Are they going to take these critical thinking skills that I employ and use those skills well to pursue the truth? Or are they just going to do them, use them to do what Socrates thinks we shouldn't do? Focus on winning the argument. Focus on looking good in front of others. Gaining power and influence in, the so- in society. Focus on doing exactly the s- sorts of things the sophists do. So I'll just leave you with this question. Do we think Socrates really has only encouraged critical thinking? Or should he have been um, more thoughtful about the fact that has he simply possibly led the young people around him to become sophist or to be more attractive to that sort of mindset? So I'll leave you with that question and stop there. I hope this video was helpful and interesting, and I will see you in the next one.